We're now going to draw the chart for Clayton Christensen's innovator's dilemma. And this is a supremely important chart. Important enough that I want you to duplicate this chart yourself so you don't just get to take a picture of what I've done. You've got to draw your own and then you take a picture of your own version and submit it. So really the best way to do that would be to take a piece of paper and a pencil and watch this video and draw your own at the same time and then take a picture of the diagram that you draw and submit that picture. So we're going to need two axes. Here they are. Along the x-axis we have time and on the y-axis we have performance. So performance y time x. And what we do is we draw a line like this, going up at some rate of change over time. And what this shows is that over time, performance improves at a certain rate. And what this relates to is this notion that when we have a new innovation, a new product, a new piece of technology, it takes us some time to figure out how to get the most performance out of it. The example I like to give is um, driving. Cast your mind back to the very first time you drove. And you're in the car, you're going along the street, and everything's whipping by you really fast. And you dare to glance down at the speedo, and you look down, and you're going like 20 miles an hour. And here you are, you know, a year, two years, three years later, and you're going down the same street, and you feel like you're going really slowly, and nothing's whipping by at all, and you glance down and you're going 40 miles an hour. That's because your performance in driving improves over time. Now, I've drawn a line, but really I should draw a distribution, and that's a normal distribution, pretty well drawn, I have to say. So a normal distribution, and at the top are geeks, and at the bottom are grandmas. And I label geeks, what that means is up at the top end, so this curve would be, this line would be steeper, and it means geeks can extract out of technology more performance over time, whereas grandmas are pretty flatlining, even if you give them a brand new smartphone, they don't do much with it. I do want to point out that this is not necessarily true for all grandmas. In my own family, we have a 90 plus year old she runs marathons, um, and she's very good at them. She is in line, she lives in Los Angeles. She'll be in line at the LA Apple store to get the latest product, Apple product. So she has the brand new iPhone before you do. Plus she can text faster than you as, you as well. So anyway, that's grandmas at the bottom, geeks at the top, just to help us understand things. Now, the critical thing here is, when any new piece of technology comes out, at a particular time, its performance is going to be below what most people can use. The performance of this new piece of technology at a particular time is going to be below the performance that most people can use. Critical part of it. And what it usually means is this technology is given or sold to people who um, who don't have much money or they will only take things for free. Typically this is students, so you basically, are the ones who will get this technology because you'd rather have something that's not very good as long as it's cheap because that's all you can afford. Now, and here was the critical finding of Clayton Christensen and it was that these innovations improve at a faster rate than the rate that we can use those innovations. So the rate of improvement in the performance of the innovation over time is steeper than the rate at which we can use those improvements. And they come about in these little chunks like this. And these guys here are called sustaining innovations. Now, in the video we're going to watch from Clayton Christensen, Charlie Rose kind of backs him into saying technologies here, which is fine, can be sustaining technology or innovations, but 
in his book, Glenn Christensen talks about innovations. So there it is, those are called sustaining innovations. And a great example, and one that uh, is given uh, in the book and in the video, is Intel came out with you know, processors to put in its computers. And the first Intel processor was called, let's label it 286, because I think it was. The second one was the 386. What do you think the next one is? Yeah, 486. And the next one? Yeah, not a 586, it's a Pentium. And then Pentium, after the Pentium 1, you had Pentium 2, and then Pentium 3, and then, yeah, not a Pentium 4, this would be dual core. Dual core or quad core. All right, now, here's the important part. Once you, once the innovation, the sustaining innovation crosses this point, which is the point at which most people can use the performance, once you go beyond that, you are providing too much performance for most people. And so let's imagine this is the time here. This gap right here means you are providing more performance than most people can use at this particular time. Anytime you over provide performance, then you are gonna be charging people more money than you should be. Another good example is a Porsche 911 costs about $70,000 new for the base model, and you still get to drive it, if you drive uh, lawfully and legally, at 60 miles an hour on the road, um, which is the same as my vehicle, which costs nowhere near $60,000, $70,000. So Porsche 911s way overperform, and you pay a lot of money to get that performance, even though you can't, a lot of people can't necessarily use it, and that's what this says. Most people can't use the performance. And indeed, in the video, Clay and Christensen's going to say exactly that. Pentium has over-provided performance in its chips, and we're all paying for that, and so it makes computers too expensive. And so what comes along, nearly always, at a certain time, is something called a disruptive innovation. Disruptive innovation. Typically, again, it's provided to kids and to students um, to try things out. They don't mind having things that are crap as long as they're free or cheap. But check this out. The performance improvement provided by the engineers and people who build that goes something like this. It has the same rate of improvement. This point here is critical. It's the point w at which our disruptive innovation can meet the needs of the mainstream marketplace. Which means that all these people who have been overpaying for a quad-core processor will switch to the disruptive innovation because they can get what they need for a lot less money. So they can save a lot less money by switching over here. And indeed, Intel was one of the very few companies that disrupted themselves. So they've been developing this right here, and then they developed a Celeron processor. And originally the Celeron was kind of crap, wasn't very useful, but it got better and better and better over time. And pretty soon you can slap a Celeron in pretty much uh, most mainstream laptops, and it will get the job done for almost everything we need to do on a laptop which is, you know, Word and Excel and checking our email and, you know, surfing the web and watching Netflix. So Celeron disrupted Intel's own quad-core business, and that's great for Intel because uh, it stayed in business because there are many examples where this disruptive innovation is not the same company as the main innovation. And indeed, this line here is for Intel, but they disrupted a company that was right here and that company was called Digital Equipment Corporation. And what's fascinating about this whole thing, and indeed this is why Glenn Christensen looked into this, Digital Equipment Corporation was right here, and Intel came out right here, and Digital was named by Fortune Magazine the best run company in the world. And then two years later, they got absolutely destroyed by Intel. And indeed, have you ever heard of Digital Equipment Corporation? No, 
because they got taken out, they were disrupted by an innovation made, that was disruptive, made by Intel, that took out the core business model, which was right here. And so that is Clayton Christensen's Innovator's Dilemma. And the dilemma, we'll talk about a little later, and I'll give you a brief highlight here. The dilemma is, it's really hard to get off this path of being a sustaining innovation because you can make lots and lots and lots of money selling stuff to geeks because they have lots of money to spend. And if you talk to a geek and you ask them what they want, they're not going to say, oh, please give us a crappy slow seller on processor. No, they're going to say, heck, we need a quad car and we need it to be super fast. So you listen to your best customers, the ones who've got the most money and will make you the most money, and you get the wrong advice. You are pushing up this line. None of these people are going to tell you about these disruptive innovations. So it's really easy for great companies to fail. So now you can watch the Clayton Christensen Innovator's Dilemma video and he will talk about this very chart and give you loads of examples. Now once again, you need to recreate your own version of this chart, follow along doing what I did, and then you need to take a picture and there's a link in Moodle for you to submit your version of Clayton Christensen's Innovator's Dilemma chart.